Recording in progress. Welcome to the second season of the Now Strategos podcast. Strategos is a Greek term which roughly translated means generalship and it is part of the origin of the English word strategy. My name is Britton Jacobson. I own a few entrepreneurship endeavors, work a full-time W-2 job, and enjoy learning. I appreciate you being here. Let's get into the episode. So every once in a while, I'm going to do a solo episode as a way of you know sharing a couple things or being able to go in depth on something that I've been specifically interested in. And so this is one of those times. Uh, this week has been a lot of trying to figure out. Well, the last couple few weeks have been has been a lot of trying to figure out how to get all of my prioritize uh, priorities organized and prioritized correctly uh, because there's been a lot that's been slipping through the cracks. And so, basically, I've been using a few tools to do that. Uh, one is uh, I've been using ClickUp. Uh, the company that I work at started using it and it seemed like it might be a good solution for organizing all the different projects that I have and all the different to do's underneath it. So just sharing that as a, something I'm up to. And then second, uh, I've been using, I just got an invite to crone C R O N dot app a P P uh, online. And it's kind of like, apparently it's very similar to the Apple or MacBook. um, calendar system and but it integrates with your google calendars and it's got a bunch of uh i would say streamlined uh functionality to it i don't so far there hasn't been anything that's blown my mind other than having things like google meet and zoom you can select uh, which conference system you want to use and it automatically populates it instead of having to go in paste in the information and all that sort of thing which is pretty cool I use multiple different Google calendars for everything and that I just got access this morning. Uh, so I'm excited about that. But anyway, uh, this episode, so a couple of things that I wanted to get it. Well, I guess the main theme is books <laughs> and that's because one of the things that I think is fundamentally important that we should be spending our time on is reading and uh, it doesn't always have to be history. It doesn't always have to be something super deep or super crazy. I picked some of my favorites from this last year that I thought I would share with you. And uh, then there's a bonus at the end, um, one of my favorite all-time books. So, all right, so the first one, these are no particular order, uh, but um, but the, you'll see, I, I was having a conversation with someone recently and we were talking about reading and I was listing off these books and they mentioned how varied they are. Uh, and it's true. I, I like to read very widely. Uh, it just, you know, is a way of piquing my interest. I'm interested in a lot of different things and it uh, keeps the wheels turning uh, upstairs. So, uh, I mean, for instance, right now I'm reading a book. Uh, it's kind of, it's on heuristics to some extent or another. It's called The Drunkard's Walk and it is, um, basically about the mathematics of probability and how, and it gets into like a lot of the history of how probabilities like ancient Greeks rolling, you know, lamb bones or whatever as a way of determining what the gods wanted. And it gets into all of that and kind of shows the mathematics of it and uh, breaks it down. Just super interesting. Uh, still like on the front end of the book. So we'll see, we'll see what the rest of it has. But anyway, that's a case in point of just being reading a lot of different types of things. So, all right. So favorite books from this last year. So one is I finally finished reading David Berlinski's, uh, the devil's delusion. And basically David Berlinski is a polymath and his expertise is in physics. Um, but he's studied quite a few different things. And in the devil's delusion, he's basically going after, well, it's, it's something of a response to the God delusion by, I want to say Sam Harris. I haven't read that one. Um, but he's, uh, he's not a believer or anything like that. And he's mostly basically, I don't know, tearing apart or tearing down, I should say, a lot of the hocus pocus or the scientific uh, haughtiness of the support that goes into the that goes into the evolution. And it's not a it, it, the, the, the book is not and I wasn't reading it with the intent of. Uh, kind of going after evolution. It's more that he breaks down how, like, for instance, a, a phrase of his is, you know, the 
telling us that things change over time isn't a theory, right? It doesn't really tell us anything. We know that. <laughs> and, uh, and so anyway, and he gets into it in greater detail. He gets into quantum physics and things like that. And so that's a book I would highly recommend for people who are interested in a response to on the scientific side of things to evolution. And it's more on the theory than it is just about the science. And uh, this David Brunsky is incredibly smart. He's, his, his writing is phenomenal. And, uh, and I'll share uh, one of my favorite quotes on, uh, on Instagram here on one of my Monday quotes. Uh, I'll, I'll share it here maybe this next week. But uh, so yeah, highly recommend that book. Second is uh, I read the, um, let's go with uh, Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, The Gift of Friendship. So this book was about their, well, their friendship, obviously, and but it does a really good job of kind of telling their, it's, it's almost biographical in nature. So it's not just a breakdown of their friendship. It, it provides insight into their friendship and their communication, which is really amazing and really interesting and really engaging, especially if you're fans of the Narnia series. And if you're a fan of, um, you know, Lord of the Rings and all that stuff, which I read all those, uh, when I was growing up and it goes through and it's kind of, it, it, it separately talks about their life and how they grew up and how they kind of morphed into the people that they became. And then from there, it shares and goes into you know greater detail of how they shifted and changed over time and then how they influenced one another. In a lot of ways, C.S. Lewis had a significant impact on uh, Tolkien and on his publication of Lord of the Rings, for instance. And so it goes into detail of how that came about, how the, uh, almost the, the nature of that communication and the, uh, I want to say like the the essence of, of his impact. And it was like, it, it was both a heartwarming story as well as a, uh, a cool, I don't know, a, a cool peek into history and how different creative writers influenced one another and impacted one another, both personally. And then how that almost developed into, uh, what they ended up writing and it, very cool. Definitely recommend very easy read too, not particularly long second or a uh, third is uh, we, I read Buffalo for the Broken Heart. And this is by an author who he actually made his makes his makes or made his living by ghostwriting. So he's a he's a, a very practiced writer. And he bought this and it's a true story. He bought a ranch or like a small ranch in the Badlands of South Dakota in I want to say it's the eighties, something like that, a while back. And eighties or nineties. And he started, he was, his goal was to do regenerative farming on it or regenerative ranching. And so he wanted to run cattle and he wanted to rotate the pastures and basically bring back a lot of the wildlife, the natural wildlife that had been lost as a result of overgrazing and things like that, which just basically kills a lot of, um, a lot of the natural, not just wildlife, but a lot of natural vegetation and things like that. And he basically weaves the story of his experience with the history of the location getting into the pioneers and the Indians and the plains. And then there's this common theme of the story of the Buffalo, uh, uh, well, of uh, Buffalo in both his own life and then the, you know, the history of Buffalo going, you know, obviously back to when there were millions of them roaming the entire, you know, or the majority of the country. And so he, and then he does it. It's almost like your grandpa is telling you a story the way that he words it. And it's super engaging. And it's one of the few books in a long time that I just have not been able to put down. I devoured the entire thing and would definitely recommend it. It was, uh, it was really cool. And I shared with a few people and everyone so far that's read it also really enjoyed it. Definitely recommend it. And then uh, fourth is, I'm trying to think. Oh, okay. So this book, which I actually have it with me here. Most of these, I, I uh, those ones I think I all read on Kindle. Uh, I go back and forth between, I really like books, um, but I don't want 10 million books because I don't really, I mean, hey, I like books, right? You can see. Um, but I don't have 10 million, uh, you know, square feet where I can store all the books. And I don't always know if I'll love a book and I only really care about having books that I really like though. Be careful with that because there's someone here that I got just because they were free. And I was like, maybe I'll read that. It looks maybe interesting. So grain of salt on that overall, but this book only cry for the living by Holly McKay. 
uh, first of all, um, and you don't get a lot of this information uh, in the book. You kind of have to dig around a little bit, and I follow her on Instagram now. But um, so Holly is from Australia. She's, I think, 5'2", very tiny individual, and she grew up pursuing ballet. And then she started getting into doing, uh, she would write articles for uh, basic, uh, different things that were going on in um, uh, with celebrities and things like that. So she was at parties with like Paris Hilton back in the day when Paris Hilton was huge, things like that. And then slowly she started getting into foreign, uh, not, not, not foreign correspondence, but foreign affairs. And eventually she ended up going overseas and she was actually in Afghanistan uh, during the time, the rise of ISIS and the beat back of ISIS. And so that's what the book covers. And it cover, I want to say, trying to remember a uh, 2014 through 2018 roughly and it's basically summaries of all the notes and stories that she wrote down in her little black book uh, which she travels with as she interviewed civilians she i mean civilians on both sides of the conflict uh, she interviewed um ISIS captives. She interviewed uh, Taliban individuals, she interviewed local individuals, military individuals, the whole nine yards. She was literally on the front lines and as in like fighting and shots are going down 50 yards away, like right there. Uh, super cool story. Uh, well, I, I won't call it a story. Super cool and impactful storytelling and drawing out of the, the narratives that are otherwise going to be lost to, um, to, to, to certainly us without having direct exposure um, over time. And so I, I, I really enjoyed it because the Middle East is an area that I studied for years as part of um, my initial career trajectory. And it is something that I want to be able to, you know, I enjoy maintaining touch with to a certain extent. Um, I have a lot of other things that I maintain in touch with, of course. And then it there was Holly does a really excellent job of uh, almost writing in an ethereal way sometimes, where she she she's touching on um, she, she's touching on the I don't know, the, the the position of a poet. Um, and I actually have uh, I'll pull it up here. I actually have a couple quotes from the book that I really enjoyed. I, sh I think I shared one of them a while back on my, my uh, Monday quote on Instagram. Um, but let's see here. Where's Holly? I have an entire document full of quotes um, that I'm always adding to. <laughs> um, let's see here. Holly, there we go. All right. So here's uh, one quote. Uh, that day, Ina learned that belief in God was not enough. She learned that they needed someone, someone or something in the human form to hold their hands and guard their lives. Uh, another quote, they craved the stability even if, if, even if it meant towing the dictator's line. And then, uh, what is war? War is a vision of agony that becomes normal. That's what war does to people. And then the quote that I shared on my Instagram was, what is war? It may be as old as time, but there is no template on how to fix it, stop it, or contain it. There are no firm answers other than the distrust it perpetuates. And I really like all of those um, and, and more in the book. And she consistently asks the question, what is war? And then uh, takes a shot, uh, stabs at it in the dark at an answer. Uh, based on what the previous, you know, summaries of her experiences and what she'd written down um, had been. And so highly recommend, really enjoyed it. Okay, final recommendation. And this is a, this is a bonus because I didn't read it last year. Uh, but I've told a few people about this and I think it should go far and wide. All right, so the book is called Genghis Khan and the Making of the Modern World. I did not read this. I listened to it on audiobook. It was phenomenally well read and... Uh, Basically, it starts out covering the history of Genghis Khan as a small boy all the way up until the time he became Khan, which he really didn't really uh, he, he didn't really reach his full power or I guess the initial elements of his full influence until he was like 40 years old. So he spent years being a nothing, struggling, starting to become in charge of something, slowly taking over and then overcoming his rival, et cetera. It's, uh, stuff that I certainly had no idea about. 
And then it goes into the power and influence of the Mongols, how they extended their empire, how they fought, how they like. So, for instance, case in point, I, I had no idea they would plan years in advance uh, obviously super inhumane <laughs> but they would plan years in advance where they were going to invade they would send out raiding parties that would literally destroy everything and everyone for miles in advance so that they would then allow the grass to grow so that they could feed their horde of horses on the way like and then they would go invade wherever they were headed beyond that point crazy stuff like that and uh, you know, you learn tidbits about like, so for instance, uh, it, you know, for instance, we think of like the yeoman farmer, right? As, a, as like almost a Western civilization thing. And the like the plow itself actually came from China via the Mongol trade routes to Europe. I never would have known that. And I'm steeped in like Western civilization, education, liberal arts. Like that is my background, uh, you know. Uh, through the nose like that is <laughs> that is what I'm educated in and those are the sorts of things that I've read about and read for you know uh, I've spent a good decade plus of my life doing it and so like you learn tidbits like that that just are, are, are incredibly surprising and mind-blowing that in that you had never heard that before and then you which is I mean is, is natural right I'm not that's not I don't make that point as a way of saying there's something wrong or something should have been different relative to the education that I went through that others go through. I only bring that up. There's a wealth of knowledge out there. And if you don't spend time reading and you don't spend time expanding your mind beyond what you might learn in four, six, eight, 12 years of school or whatever, right? Then yeah, then you're not going to have a full understanding of the full picture. And and even then you'll never fully will, right? Because history is written by the victors and there's a, there's always elements that are lost. So uh, anyway, highly recommend that book. It is a long read. It's pretty thick, uh, but I, I loved it. It's right up my alley. It's a combination of history, warfare. I love studying and reading uh, con about conflict and war and stuff like that. And and then just some really cool like uh, civilization impacting, I don't know, uh, movements and dynamics that um, that I had never been aware of before I read the book. So phenomenal, super cool, super interesting. Okay, sorry, another one, case in point. You learn in the book that like the ch Chinese, the China as we know it today with the, um, what do they call it? Like the Hidden Palace or whatever. The Hidden Palace was started by the Khan that ruled in that area as a way of controlling the Chinese populace. Like that's where they, like I think it's the Hidden Palace comes from. It's from the Mongol Khan that when they took over, like that's, and then slowly, obviously it separated as the Mongol empire kind of crumbled and fell apart. But I, I like how impactful has that been on Chinese history and world history uh, up in, you know, a, a, and yet it's a, a descendant of a Mongol, you know, a Mongols, uh, you know, strategy, right? Crazy stuff like that. So Anyway, and even, you know, they ruled, uh, I'm getting carried away here, you know, they, they, the way that they ruled was actually relatively lenient. They're the ones that came up with like accounting systems and common currency in a lot of ways um, and that influenced what, you know, uh, how money was being transferred and a bunch of stuff back then. Like they started writing stuff down uh, as a way of keeping track of like their m massive empire and just like a lot of things that ended up influencing a lot of what happened in the western world or just influence the region in general uh just incredible stuff so highly recommend and uh yeah so i'll put links to all these all these uh books in the description so you can go on amazon or whatever so you can go find them so that you're not trying to figure out which ones i was talking about and uh, if you're interested in seeing quotes from different things that i read and whatever you follow me on instagram find that down below it's at born great b-o-u-r-n-e because jason Bourne was like my first hero in uh, high school <laughs> Um, and, uh, every Monday I share like a Monday quote and usually it's got, uh, something like that going on in it. And, um, what else? If, uh, every once in a while I'll also share a different sort of thing or different sort of quote and things like that on Twitter. So you can follow me there at Britton Jacobson. And, uh, other than that, I hope you have a, an awesome week, awesome day, and uh, I'll catch you next week. I have some really cool guests lined up coming forward that I'm very, very, very excited about. Uh, they'll be my first kind of super, you know, not, I shouldn't say that. They will be 
probably like level two or even level three guests, uh, whereas I've been around level one, level two as I've been trying to grow the podcast. So very excited about that. Uh, take care.